Hello, I am Jolinda LeClaire, Director of Drug Prevention Policy for Vermont. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, which Governor Phil Scott established by executive order in January 2017. Since then, the Council has focused on its mission to improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges through prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. This crisis touches everyone in our state. Many Vermonters have family members and loved ones who have become addicted after receiving opioid prescriptions for pain. Others were exposed to opioids and other drugs through friends, dealers, and traffickers. Regardless of how they were exposed, we know we have among us many who now have the chronic, isolating, and too often deadly disease of addiction. We are making progress. Treatment is available across the state through Vermont's nationally known hub and spoke system of treatment. Recovery centers in our communities are providing effective wraparound support to help people achieve long-term recovery. Many communities are building prevention coalitions to provide our children and families the tools they need to be resilient in the face of life's challenges and traumas. Vermont law enforcement has steadily worked to increase community safety and to decrease the supply of illegal drugs. They also work hard to support prevention strategies that will reduce the demand for opioids. There is more we can do and must do to turn the curve on Vermont's opioid challenges. Drug prevention education is a top priority for schools and communities. Increasing intervention opportunities in emergency rooms and other places will help more people enter treatment and recovery. Individuals and families in recovery need support to obtain jobs and rebuild their lives, and support for harm reduction through safe and appropriate use and disposal of drugs and syringes will increase safety in homes and communities. Something we all can do to take every opportunity to raise awareness and reduce stigma by talking about addiction. To highlight the science of addiction, as well as the cultural, social, and economic challenges associated with addiction, the producers and hosts of Vermont Cable Access and the Opioid Coordination Council have created an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis, working together to create a more resilient community. The third in this series is about recovery and recovery coaching. In this segment, host Ed Baker and his guests explore the process of recovery from opioid addiction. The Opioid Coordination Council's strategies highlight the need for a strong statewide network of recovery centers, recovery coaches, and supports. These services are essential to Vermonters working toward long-term recovery and to their families and loved ones. Hi everybody, I'm Ed Baker. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel otherwise known as ARC. ARC is a channel, a public TV channel, that is dedicated, devoted to providing information, accurate, current information to the general public focused on this brain disease that we call addiction or substance use disorder. <clears throat> the idea is that if the general public has accurate information, their response will be a groundswell, and we see it today, a literal groundswell of compassion and inclusion for this particular population in Vermont, people suffering from substance use disorder. The ultimate goal is actually to save lives. <clears throat> so thank you, Jalinda, for your introduction. Today's focus, the focus of today's program will be recovery strategies and recovery supports. And to that end, it's my pleasure to welcome Peter uh, Espenshade, the Chief Executive Officer at the Vermont Alliance for our Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. Great to be here. Thank Thanks. you, Ed. Thank you for being on the really show, Peter. enjoy this work. Uh, Peter, Peter brings a uh, distinguished uh, history of academic uh, and public service uh, contributions. His first job in Vermont was as the uh, executive director for the Lake Champlain Fund. Land Trust, yes. Lake Champlain Land Trust. 
Second job was as the um, vice president. At the Vermont Community Foundation. At the Vermont yes. Community Foundation. He's presently held his uh, current position at VAMHAR since 2013. So, Peter, I guess mm -hmm. the, the subject of today's show is recovery supports and recovery strategies, mm -hmm. as outlined by Governor Scott's um, Council on, 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 on the Opioid Epidemic. Mm -hmm. So my first question to you is, you know, we, we hear this word recovery quite often, but yeah. what, what, what does it mean? What, what is it? What's the definition of it? Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, first off, I think you're right on. I think folks are really getting it culturally, what treatment is, what recovery is, how we can help folks heal from this health condition. So the way I like to look at it is there's kind of two phases to one's substance use disorder. Is there is the acute phase where one is really suffering and where one may go into treatment at a residential or an outpatient treatment center. And then what happens after that? What happens after that if we are to be successful culturally and as a public health concern is we need to support folks who are coming out of that acute phase, out of that treatment phase, and probably support them throughout their entire life. Hmm. And that's recovery. Recovery is the long-term care, the love and supports that we give to individuals um, to stay clean and sober, to stay focused on their recovery. And it's, it's really... In, it, it's one of my favorite parts of this work mm. because it has the longest horizon and it's really the most heartfelt and the most positive. Mm. People recover mm -hmm. and more and more people are going to recover the more we understand and bolster recovery supports. I understand that and that's a beautiful uh, uh, description. Thank you, Peter. So just to build on that a little bit. <clears throat> so a person breaks their arm yep. <clears throat> and it's an acute medical incident. They go in for acute medical care. Yep. Their arm is set, maybe there's a cast, there's some pain medication, the cast is taken off after a few weeks, there's physical therapy, and then they go back to business as usual and the episode is over. Yep. Not so with substance use disorder. No, it's not. And that it's a, it's a great question because it brings up one of my favorite analogies. You know, all of us are trying to understand what is the opioid epidemic, what is addiction, what is substance use disorder. And the analogy, at least that I use from in my own mind, is the analogy of type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's substance use disorder is far more of a chronic condition the way type 2 diabetes is. So one may um, have an acute phase in their struggles with type 2 diabetes. They may be hospitalized. They may be in some form of shock. They get that immediate treatment. Mm -hmm. And then there is long-term maintenance of their health after that. Mm -hmm. And I think <clears throat> it's almost a direct analogy with substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Is an individual has suffered from it. It can reach an acute phase. They then have the courage and the wherewithal and support to go into treatment. That's the analogy with the hospitalization with type 2 diabetes. And then just like with somebody with type 2 diabetes, they're only going to be successful with long-term, healthy, health-based maintenance and support moving forward. All it's right. exactly the same thing. All right. So there's recovery and health over the entire lifespan. You bet. You All right. Bet. Like a person with diabetes would have to maybe take insulin shots, watch their diet, do certain exercises, go in for uh, periodic checkups. A person with substance use disorder in recovery would have to do certain behaviors and have to watch out for certain behaviors and obtain certain supports maybe throughout the course of their life. Absolutely. So there would be no relapse. Or if there were a relapse, it would be identified and dealt with immediately. You bet. And, and it, it's bingo. <clears throat> All and, right. and the same yeah. thing with, with type 2 diabetes is it's, you know, individuals will have better days, better years. They may slip back, move forward. And, you know, that community is wonderful in supporting mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And we're lucky in Vermont because we have a very supportive recovery community. Oh, yeah. And, sure. and by that, I don't only mean folks like me who happen to be an individual in recovery. Mm -hmm. I mean 
everybody, mm -hmm. seemingly everyone that we run into uh, throughout the state is cheering folks on. You know, I couldn't agree more. And that's for that groundswell of compassion. Yep. We literally saw it at the recovery walk yes. in Burlington this summer, literally cheering people on. The general public was out there saying, yeah, go ahead, nice going, keep it up. And people in recovery were walking. There was no shame. There was all aff affirmation. It was beautiful. It was really beautiful. And I, <clears throat> it, you know, I know that in the, in the very, very early days <clears throat> of Burlington's recovery walk, there would be a small number of individuals in recovery, mm -hmm. really courageous, mm -hmm. right? Sort of mm -hmm. the trailblazers of our field. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they weren't jeered necessarily, but nobody was cheering them on or patting them on the back. A little it was, suspicion there. Yeah, it was a little like, ah, uh, right? Because it's because <laughs> simply because folks didn't know, mm -hmm. right? I like mm -hmm. it, it, you know, maybe being optimistic about the potential for human nature. And yeah. I think folks didn't know. It was like, ah, uh, I don't know what addiction is. It's a little weird. Um, but folks are getting it, and you're right. When we were walked down Church Street this year, yeah. strangers, mm. shoppers, visitors, tourists were applauding yeah. folks mm. in recovery saying, good for you. And that, in many ways, is sort of a, a little uh, metaphor for recovery support. So it's a community <clears throat> cheering us along. It's true. Less stigma, more compassion, more inclusion, uh, less discrimination. Yep. You know, and um, thank you and what you do at the uh, Recovery Coaching Institute. You know, I'd like, to, I'd like to ask you now about something called Pathways to Recovery. What, what is meant by Pathways to Recovery? Are there many ways that someone can enter into recovery, or is there just one set way that someone has to do? What are, what are Pathways to Recovery? Oh, good. Great question, because I, I think it's really a parallel question to your, to your earlier observation. Culturally, we, we in the United States, and probably elsewhere, we only had one model of recovery. We only had one model that we knew worked and that we saw work with ourselves or our friends and our loved ones. Mm -hmm. And that model was what's called the 12-step approach. Mm -hmm. we, we're maybe familiar with that through Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. It's a great mm -hmm. path to recovery based on the 12 steps. Started by two Vermonters, by the way, which was friggin' awesome. Um, and, uh, and we know that. And when I first got into recovery, I, I saw that my friends were using that as shorthand. They were saying, how's AA going? How are the 12 mm -hmm. steps doing? Even though my path was something different. 12 step is an amazing path. It is the foundational path mm -hmm. in recovery. Mm -hmm. What we've learned over the past, especially over the past 20 years, I would say, is that there are other paths mm -hmm. that are equally effective, um, that are different. They may be complementary, they may be completely different, but all of these roads lead to the same summit, mm -hmm. which is a healthy, supported lifestyle of recovery. Um, and there's some really interesting paths that have been coming, out, coming around lately and growing in popularity. So in other words, then, that if somebody has a unique path mm -hmm. to recovery, that's as valid as the tried and true 12-step path. Someone comes into recovery through a church mm -hmm. or through a relationship with a friend or maybe spontaneously yeah. enters into a, like a path to recovery. This is as valued as what has historically been the tried and true path. Absolutely. So some of those paths that we mm -hmm. see in Vermont that mm -hmm. are very popular are the Buddhist path. Mm -hmm. That is the fastest growing path in recovery. Wow. It's also known as refuge recovery. We've got some nice meetings throughout the state. There's a path called Smart Recovery, which is a, a mm. simplified form of recovery that works really well. I mean, simplified in the good sense mm -hmm. of that term. Mm -hmm. Of course, the number of 12-step paths. There are faith-based paths right. in, exactly. in the Christian church and in other faiths. Mm. There are medicated-assisted paths where individuals continue to take different medications to, to help their recovery mm. moving forward. Mm. What, what's interesting is not only the fact that there are so many paths, that lead to the same summit, but that many folks are on multiple paths. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes an individual will go to some 
AA meetings and then go to a Buddhist meeting and then work with their psychiatrist and then meet with uh, friends or participate in a sober softball league mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. live in a sober house. That, you know, there's not just one dogma. Yeah. Because people yeah. are complicated. Yeah, and, that's beautiful. And that's mm -hmm. that kind of multiple supports that yeah. I think is, is yeah. really the nicest part of the whole thing. To cast thing. the widest net possible. Why not? Bring in as many people as possible. You know, why not? That, there's not one true way. There, mm -hmm. there are many ways. And it's also not a, a perfect process, is it? God, no. Someone <laughs> can go and there can be a recurrence of substance use yep. or, or a lapse, maybe for a month or a year or however long, and they're welcome back to the path. That maybe that was part of their process. Maybe they had to learn that way. You know, they're welcome back to the path when they're ready to come back. Absolutely. And there's supports out there to try to pull them back into, into the recovery path, correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I think that that is, you know, the onus is on us and the recovery community. Mm -hmm. I think that's the next level of public awareness that we're charged with getting out there mm -hmm. is what we, what we will call relapse or backsliding or mm -hmm. ta taking a step back is often part of the process. And, um, it, it, you know, Mark Twain said, uh, quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and I think anybody who, who's tried to quit something, some sort of addiction, knows it's hard. Mm -hmm. But eventually, through support, it sticks. And, you know, when you look at addiction as a brain disease, you realize the complexities of some of the impairments that actually occur in a person's brain. And they just don't disappear Sometimes they lag on and hold on and reappear. And recovery, you know, takes an, an effort over time. And people are just not perfect. Sometimes yeah. they'll move backwards and move forwards. How many of us haven't taken two steps back and three steps forward and one step back and two steps forward? And that's, that's what compassion really is all about, to not approach people with any kind of judgmental attitude. And I think that... I'd like you to talk about that a little bit, about your recovery coach uh, training, mm -hmm. the Institute, and how your coaches really are taught to not be judgmental, yes, but to see people you know, with value and meet them where they are. Talk about that a little bit, Peter. Great. So, so mm -hmm. you know, one second of background, we run the Recovery Coach Academy, which is a 40-hour training. Uh, where we certify Vermont's recovery coaches. Mm -hmm. So what is a recovery coach? A recovery coach will focus on really three things. So the first, to answer your question, is recovery coaches believe in the principle that the opposite of addiction is connection. Nice. <clears throat> that the way folks, and there's some, some really good developing science around this. This is not just a... a, a nice thought. Mm -hmm. there, there is some good research being done around this. It's still a hypothesis, but there's a lot of truth to it. The opposite of addiction <clears throat> is connection. So by connecting folks back to society, no matter where they are on their path to recovery, not by excluding them or punishing them mm. or intervening or cutting off them from their family, but mm -hmm. re-engaging them, mm -hmm. that act of human connection is one that really sparks long-term recovery. So much more appealing and attractive. <clears throat> and we used to have the model, as you know, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the 90s, it was the dominant model, 80s and 90s, intervention. Mm -hmm. So if you're suffering from substance use disorder, mm -hmm. I'm going to cut you off. Mm -hmm. I could be your brother, and I'm going to say, if you don't get clean, mm -hmm. I'm cutting you off. Oh, I'm like going to intervene in your life. Tough, tough love. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it's... <clears throat> It's BS. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if we connect people, then we get those natural bonds, those naturally occurring opioids, that dopamine, that human healthy bonding for society and for the tribe and for family and partners that really works. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. It's awesome stuff. And I think one of the other principles of uh, recovery coaching is meeting the person where they are. Yep. And, and not, 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 not di dictating a route, but more finding uh, and helping the person to motivate to find their route, to find their path, and take activity in their path. You bet. <clears throat> and that's, I, I think that's the, that's the second big pillar as I talk about mm -hmm. this is, mm -hmm. 
you know, we'll say meeting people with their all, where they are. We'll talk about honoring the individual, you know. And what does that mean? It means what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We are not, recovery coaches aren't there to preach a certain modality or a certain path to recovery. They're there to listen, to find out where an individual is out, mm -hmm. and then to find the strengths that we can build on to keep them moving forward. All right, so now that's clear. Now say for instance, let me give you like a, an hypothesis, a yep. situation. Say for instance, uh, a person like actively involved in addiction, you know, in injecting drugs every day, yep. manages to find his or her way to a recovery center. Mm -hmm. And sits down then with a recovery coach. Yep. Would that would that recovery coach then try to do therapy with that person, or would they recognize the gravity of that person's situation and refer that person for medical attention with the understanding that they would then come back? What there, would the recovery yeah, coach's it, role be? Really good question. The mm -hmm. recovery coach does only two things, mm -hmm. in essence, mm -hmm. only two. Mm -hmm. And we recovery coaches, we are not counselors, mm -hmm. we're not psychiatrists, mm -hmm. we're not social workers, mm -hmm. we um, are recovery coaches. What does that mean? Number one, it means we are extremely well trained and we practice motivational interviewing. Okay. What does that mean? It means deep, deep listening. Mm -hmm. It means sitting with someone not telling someone what to do, but just listening. Mm -hmm. We believe that listening is an act of love, mm -hmm. and listening is a clinically proven act of healing, mm -hmm. and that's what's awesome. called <clears throat> motivational interviewing. So if in your scenario an individual came in, I wouldn't um, prescribe and say, here's, who you, here's what you're doing and here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. No. The way we heal is by listening. That's mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. And we've got, it's deep listening that requires training. Mm -hmm. Number two, the second thing we do is we offer resources in a way that's non-threatening to the individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you came in in that scenario, if I were doing my coaching job poorly, I would say, you're clearly using, you need to get into treatment. What's that gonna do to you? All right, probably make me feel a little bit nervous. Are mm -hmm. you gonna ever come back? I'm not so sure. Probably not, I'm right? I'm not so sure. But, but because mostly people are told what to do wherever they go. Right. And they're told what to do mainly with a, like a punitive um, kind of a tone to it. And they, they don't respond well to that. No. How often are we listened to in life? Mm -hmm. How often are we really listened to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at the Coaching Academy, one of our homework assignments is, you, you know, over the next over the next night or week, feel what it feels like to be listened to yeah. and feel how warm and human and connected that is. Yeah. That's why we say as a coach, stay in your lane and listen and then provide resources in a really thoughtful way. I'm really liking that. It's, so, it's so good to have you explain this because I know a lot of the people, the general public, myself included, don't really understand the, the depth and the work that's gone into developing this role. How many, how many recovery coaches would you say we, um, we have in Vermont right now? We've got, uh, we've got about 100 coaches currently um, actively working and volunteering. Our, uh, the Vermont Recovery Coach Academy has trained a, a couple hundred folks uh, with folks coming from California, from oh, really? Kentucky, from other states. Wow, wow, um, congratulations. And a, and a lot from Vermont. Well, I think that it, you know we were one of the first trainings. We certainly were not the first. Mm -hmm. We were founded on the great work of the Connecticut Recovery Coach Academy. Um, but we were one of the first, and so other states would send their people to us. And now we're, we're solely uh, slow solely focused on Vermont and training Vermonters. Yeah, we, you know, we do seem to be, Vermont does seem to be leaders in this field. Yep. We have so many, we have the Hub and Spoke program, we have Naloxone, we have recovery coaching. It's really something that, that this state here, uh, us, we should really be proud of that. So where do you, where do you see your, um, your field going, yeah. the, the field of recovery coaching? Where do you think it's going? What's the, the immediate future of how this will roll out in, in Vermont. Yeah, so I think we are um, 
at a good phase now, and I think we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got the, the training really well defined. We've got a clear evidence-based training mm -hmm. that's appropriate for this field, that keeps our coaches in their lane, doing good work, and there's no shortage of work to yeah, do yeah, I in, hear you. in that lane. Yes, absolutely. So, so now as coaching, recovery coaching grows more and more popular, mm -hmm. um, we'll need to think about, well, what does that mean? Do we ever want to may, you know, have billing codes for Medicaid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, you know, right now we're certifying coaches. Mm -hmm. What does that mm -hmm. mean? That means we're certifying that folks have completed the training mm -hmm. and can abide by the basic rules of coaching. Mm -hmm. But we need to make sure we're getting continued education and recertifying folks and taking the next level in, in this professional health field um, to help it grow and stay really strong. I mean, I just can't, I can't as a professional in the field, I was in private practice for over 30 years, I, I just can't tell you how encouraged I am by this. Because to me, you, we have a, a vulnerable population with brain disease mm -hmm. that up until now has had inadequate supports to continue in, 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 in health after they've achieved health from treatment. Yeah. The recovery supports just weren't there. So you would have a population where a large percentage of them would complete treatment, come out of treatment, yeah. back to the community where there's cues and triggers and drugs available and lots of pressure to go back to that old way of life. And because of an absence of adequate supports, there was a high, what we would call, relapse rate. Yep. And we would lose a lot of people that way. Now you have these same folks maybe coming out of residential treatment or coming out of psychotherapy with community supports in place, recovery uh, coaching in place, which, which what you're saying theoretically will be available throughout the lifespan. Yeah. So you have this whole population of people that are getting better that potentially will stay better. And if they don't, will get better again right. and stay better right. then. And the other, the other thing I see is that there's this encouragement to them to just give, to continue to give back yeah. to the developing recovering community. Do you see that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that, mm -hmm. there's just something so... Many, many of our recovery coaches are what we call peers, mm -hmm. and peer is a is a jargon for somebody who's in recovery themselves, mm -hmm. who has the lived experience. Mm -hmm. And we've also got family members and allies out there. Peers want to give back because it's a way of sort of paying it forward. Somebody nice. helped them. Nice. They want to help others. Family members mm -hmm. can provide a real special empathy to other family members. Oh, I would like, imagine. what's it like? I would imagine. And and we're getting a you know a small but increasing number of allies of folks who are just out in the community, who who feel this, who see this every day, yeah. and say, mm -hmm. what can I do to help? What can I do to sit down and listen? and really care mm -hmm. about what people are going through mm -hmm. and then to provide some resources that might be helpful to this person. I feel so encouraged by you. You know, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, you and your, uh, your institute, you know, the Vermont Alliance for Mental Health and Addiction Recovery and your uh, Recovery Coaching Institute for the many uh, cont contributions you've made. And I know for a fact that a lot of your, um, a lot of your training is uh, provided uh, Free of charge? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So um, I encourage folks, we are adding trainings, given the nature of this public health issue, mm -hmm. we're adding trainings, new mm -hmm. trainings every week. Mm -hmm. Many of our trainings are selling out, but mm -hmm. don't let that distract <laughs> your viewers because we're at, mm -hmm. there'll always be new ones for folks to come to. What a great thing that we have a demand of people who want to get trained in how to help. What better problem could the state have? Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say that there'll be a slide going up now um, showing your contact information. Oh, nice. Nice. <clears throat> um, so people who want to get in touch with Peter or the Vermont Alliance for Mental Health and, and Addiction Recovery, feel free to do that. I want to give you a few seconds to address the population out there with substance use disorder. If, if there are people out there right now watching yep. that have substance use disorder, Peter, what, what, what would be your message to them? Is, is that um, mm. I think two things. Number one, people recover. And so many of the individuals I work with who've suffered from this, somewhere in their heart, 
they know that they're thinking someday about recovering. Yeah. And it's a real message of hope mm -hmm. is that people do recover. And then number two, mm -hmm. you don't need to do it alone. There are so many caring, non-judgmental, talented, cool, appropriate <laughs> people who, who are there whenever you're ready, whenever mm -hmm. you're ready to support your recovery. <clears throat> Uh, because we we miss you. We miss you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Really enjoyed this. And I just want to say to the viewers that uh, the next segment of this show will have one of those people who care deeply uh, about people approaching recovery and in recovery. Andrew Gagné from the Vermont um, Friends of Recovery will be on to talk a little bit about uh, recovery housing. So don't go away. Thank you. Welcome back to our show on recovery strategies and supports. Uh, it's my privilege today, uh, my pleasure today, to have as our guest, Andrew Gagne. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, truly honored to be here, and uh, it's wonderful uh, that you also have this opportunity to be able to do this show. I think it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew is... Um, the operations, director of operations and co-founder, along with David Regal of Vermont Foundations of Recovering. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I guess I'd like you to just uh, jump right in and tell the viewing audience what V4 is all about. Uh, well, I mean, our mission is to um, have a recovery home uh, throughout uh, the state of Vermont uh, and in every like big county. Uh, we kind of have the same philosophy as uh, CCV, you know, uh, wherever you live in the state of Vermont, we want to make sure that the, within a half an hour, there's a, there's a recovery home. And uh, so that's pretty much our mission. And, and thus far, we're doing pretty good. Uh, um, right now, we have most of our locations uh, in the Chittenden area, uh, Burlington, South Burlington, and Essex Junction. And we also have a house in uh, St. Albans, Vermont. We did have one in Waterbury uh, for about four years, and then we decided that um, uh, to relocate to Barry. Uh, so we're just looking for uh, the the right fit for us uh, to move to Barry. Um, Waterbury was a great community, uh, but a lot of our members had to travel for certain services, and a lot of people when they're in early recovery and move into a recovery home, uh, traveling is kind of a difficult thing. So. Sure. Uh, we're, we're always trying to uh, make sure that we're close to like a bus line and, and a recovery center, uh, work, you know, just everything that is in walking distance. Yeah, yeah. From what from what I can see about what you're doing, everything you do is with great sensitivity to people in early recovery. About how how long have you been operating? I mean, that's that's incredible that you've expanded to that number of uh, homes. In, in how long a period of time? Uh, so we've been a nonprofit for five years. Five years. Yeah. Yeah. Five years. Yeah, I've, I've been personally doing recovery homes for about ten years. As long, you know, David Regal as well. He's been doing it for about ten years, and mm -hmm. we just happened to link up and, and decided we wanted to. Uh, we knew that we could only do as much as we could being individual people, you know. So we uh, decided to come together and, and become a nonprofit and see if we can you know, expand uh, the services that is much needed throughout the state of Vermont. Partnership. Partnership is, is what's needed, and I think many of us in the state are seeing that now, and there's so many wonderful partnerships that are developing all over the place. You know, what's the uh, philosophy of um, a recovery home or a sober home? What, 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 what underlies, what's the underlying principle? <clears throat> um, so there are a few different models out there, uh, but one of the things that we really try to promote is a family-like family -like atmosphere and safety. So uh, we're really concerned about the safety of the house as a whole and, and creating an environment where, uh, you know, that it's a, a family, community. Uh, we do a lot of, or we try to do a lot of uh, community-based things outside mm -hmm. of the house uh, with uh, whether it's different agencies or, um, uh, whether it's, you know, the recovery center, but somehow trying to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. And I think extensive uh, support services are in place for all uh, your residents. I mean, it, it speaks to the nature of addiction that in the beginning of a person's path to recovery, they're most vulnerable. And I think your services really speak directly to that. Mm -hmm. uh, research over, over the, the course of addiction work has shown that there's a, uh, a high rate of what we call recurrence of substance use in early recovery. 
is is your program designed to um, to guard against that to help people to achieve abstinence and, and begin that road to recovery in a strong way yeah we uh, we try to create that as much as possible um, we definitely use um, outside you know what we try to stick to what our mission is, right? And, and our mission really is, is just to create a, uh, a safe and sober living environment for the individual to recreate their lives. Mm -hmm. So we don't provide like counseling at the house and things like that. We do provide a lot of peer-to-peer -peer work. Uh, we do have house mentors, um, but we partner with other uh, you know, agencies out there so that way they are getting those things. <clears throat> I think some of the things that we run into is you know, it's, it's really important that the whole house is safe. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, we always have to keep that in mind. Um, so if an individual, you know, might uh, have had a slip, uh, we uh, depending on the situation, we may have to uh, get them to you know go to a detox or a rehab if they you know want to continue mm -hmm. that path. Mm -hmm. um, which can you know uh, relapses. You know, you get this sense of real shame and guilt when you relapse, and and to you know move them out of that safe place into another place can be very challenging mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but we try to do our best to facilitate that in the safest way possible i see that and i see that your program is very sensitive to people in early recovery i noticed that one of the safeguards if i'm not mistaken one of the safeguards is a i think it's a, a mandate or a very strong requirement that the person would engage in some type of uh, recovery support activity every day mm -hmm. daily is that true yeah, we uh, the first thirty days is pretty strict. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, our goal is is in the first thirty days is get them uh, in whatever recovery path that is for them, mm -hmm. and that they're um, pursuing that recovery path, uh, whether it be uh, you know self help <clears throat> groups, uh, twelve state ba uh, based, or whether it be like a IOP intensive outpatient. Um, you know, we encourage counseling, recovery <clears throat> coaching, just. We try to provide as much information on, on all the different um, ways of, of to recovery as mm -hmm, possible, mm -hmm. um, and then it's kind of on them to pursue that. And so in the first 30 days, they are uh, required to go and seek out recovery every day. So. Yeah. And again, again, it's, uh, I think, well informed by, you know, the theory of uh, addiction as a brain disease, that in, in the beginning, uh, the brain is impaired. It needs time to heal. Mm -hmm. And, and in those first days or months, <clears throat> the more support, the better. The more motivation that the person can borrow from others around them, uh, the better. Where, where did this idea uh, come from, Andrew, if you don't mind me asking? When, when did you envision, first envision this? Uh, well, uh, for me, I uh, struggle with, um, you know, alcoholism and drug addiction. And... Uh, it led me to um, being incarcerated uh, myself. So I was incarcerated for three years, and towards the end of my stay, um, you know, I did a lot of, even prior to going to jail, um, I did a lot of um, mm. uh, changing and, and seeking um, uh, a different way of life. So when I was incarcerated, I was already on that path of seeking a different way of life. So in my process of uh, doing that towards the end of my stay, um, you, know, uh, my, you know, my higher power put on my heart uh, to that, you know, something needed to be done. When I was incarcerated, uh, there was tons of people that kept coming back, and and mm -hmm. and most of, you know, probably 80% of people incarcerated suffer from this uh, illness. And and one of the things that I saw the same thing of was, you know, people would uh, do really well when they're in there because it's really structured. And mm -hmm. yes, you can get stuff, but you can also not get stuff, you know, a little bit easier. Meaning, so, meaning drugs. Yes, drugs, yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, when people uh, would leave, they would kind of go back right to the same exact place where they left. Mm -hmm. So no matter how much uh, growth you might have done inside, it's really hard to go back to the exact same living environment and then think you're going to you know, fight it off. Absolutely. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, it was put on my heart to uh, create something that can, might be able to change that. That's beautiful. So, so like a, like a, a calling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. and uh, uh, from what I understand, this is uh, it's your your life's work. It's what you're dedicating yourself to. <clears throat> yeah, as soon as I, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to get up my high school diploma in jail, and I was fortunate enough to uh, work in the Career Resource Center um, with uh, Bronnie Plukis and um, 
you know, had access to things and I was able to kind of, you know, create my vision. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, about six months I was out of jail, I met with uh, DOC and, you know, wanted the Department of Corrections and, and give them kind of my ideas. And, mm -hmm. you know, they said, you know, you should start a nonprofit. And so I'd just done three years in jail and I've only been out for six months. And it was like, I don't even know how to tie my shoes most of the time. So to, 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 I didn't even know what a nonprofit even was. So I, I kind of put that on the back burner and, and uh, found a different way to kind of get started. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. What a journey, huh? Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. You know, and, and from where I sit, uh, I see so many stories uh, like your own and like mine. So many people who um, journey from, from a life characterized by all the behaviors uh, that become necessary because of addiction, uh, achieve uh, recovery, and go on to, to just give back and get so much a reward of a reward out of uh, giving back. Thank you. Thank you for your, your creativity and for your dedication. Uh, for the viewing audience, I will have Andrew... Um, back uh, toward the end of the year for a full show so we can dig a little deeper into what you're about and what your program is about. We're, uh, we'll run a slide now on how to get in touch with Andrew or people from uh, Vermont Foundation of Recovery. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you, Andrew, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. For this uh, section of our show on recovery strategies and supports, it's my honor to have Gary DeCarolis, Executive Director of the Turning Point Center of Chittenden County, and Kelly Briere, mm -hmm. the coordinator for the New Moms Program. Uh, Gary uh, comes to us after being president of the Center for Community Leadership. He also has experience in child mental health and experience in uh, city government, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Thank you for being here, Gary. Thanks, Thank Sam. you, Kelly. Great to be here. I guess I'd like to just jump right in, uh, Gary. Can you um, tell us a little bit about uh, the Chittenden Turning Point mm -hmm. and um, what makes it special? Sure. What makes it work? Well, we... Uh, thank you for asking that question. I, we, we, we pride ourselves in being a... Um, uh, a a very heartfelt recovery center. It's a peer-run recovery center. We have over 3,000 guest visits a month in our center. Uh, we're open seven days a week, about 84 hours a week, um, every day of the year. And um, our job one is to create a safe and drug-free environment for people in recovery. We know that about 65% of our guests are in their first year of recovery which is a very fragile, special time for someone. Mm. So uh, issues of housing, employment, trauma are very large and looming for everyone. Um, and also they're, they've been beaten up spiritually, physically, in any way you want to talk about it. And so we want to make sure when they walk through our door, they're greeted with a, um, a warm hello and offered all that we offer in the center. Uh, one of the things that we do offer everyone is having a, a recovery peer support specialist mm. meet them. And that's someone that's in recovery themselves that's job is to work the floor and make sure that they connect with everybody and see how they're doing in the recovery and what can we do to help support them. And maybe it's listening to them uh, about the day or, or what's going on in their life. Maybe it's referring them to a different community agency to get some services they might need. Um, and um, so we also know that uh, many of our guests are also dealing with um, depression, anxiety issues. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, they come in with a lot. And we want to make sure that we can help unpackage that somehow for them and know that they're special and unique. And that if they uh, can hang in there in their recovery and grow that with our support, um, there's a good life ahead for them. Wow. <clears throat> that is so encouraging and so refreshing to hear that kind of sensitivity, especially for this population that is so uh, misunderstood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the fact that you're open uh, so many hours a week, 365 days a year, 
That is incredible. How many volunteers do you have? Well, I, you, you know, you, you asked the right question because we couldn't do that without our volunteer corps. Mm -hmm. We've got between 25 and 30 volunteers. Mm -hmm. These are all people in recovery themselves. They have to have 60 days of sobriety to be a volunteer. Mm -hmm. We train them up. And, um, you know, they volunteer anywhere from 4 to 20 hours a week, wow. um, which allows us to have that kind of support throughout the week and throughout the year. It's, uh, we couldn't do it without them. Um, uh, so you have volunteers, and then I think you also have a, a recovery coaching? We have a very uh, vibrant uh, team of recovery coaches, about a dozen, mm -hmm. and they cover all the ages, the gender issues, um, their own um, history is unique to themselves. And the way we work it here is someone who wants a more intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone we have a recovery coach supervisor, Ken Johnson, and his job is to match the person who wants a coach with one of our 12 coaches and begin that relationship. And that, um, that can go on for as long as the two of them think it's uh, purposeful. And that, that can be, that relationship, that special recovery coaching relationship, yes. that is uh, many times in addition to the person maybe having a sponsor exactly. and also a therapist exactly. and other people that might be uh, exactly. also supportive. Yes, and the coaches reflect our vision that there are, there's no one path to recovery, mm -hmm. but there's an infinite number of paths. And so helping that person find their path and having that coach support that, mm -hmm. whatever that might look like for them, is um, not only what the center believes in, but it's what our recovery coaches are trained in helping support. So along those lines, like finding your path to recovery, if a person comes into the, uh, the, 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 the Chittenden Turning Point mm -hmm. and is, uh, has been through trauma and is a little, maybe not too social, yep. so they would, they would be allowed to come into the center and just kind of sit around and be part of the community, but 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 just feel it out until they achieve Absolutely. some level of comfort yes and we in fact many times if i if you uh, use the analogy of a flower that hasn't bloomed yet well people will come in they'll find a little corner for them to to sit uh grab they'll grab a cup of coffee and sometimes they just sit literally for days yeah. um, and then i'll watch them over time and they make a little connection of course our peer support specialists will have nudge their way into their life a little bit. <laughs> and then you can see the slow opening up. You know, we have a couple uh, recovery, I mean, employment consultants, and they might find their way over there too and see if they need any help with a resume or trying to deal with employment issues or housing might be another big issue on their plate. They have computers in the center that they can use for these things as well. <clears throat> and over time, you see them open up a little bit more, a little yeah. bit more. Then they might want to become a volunteer themselves after a couple of months. Yeah. And then that's a whole cadre of people that support each other on top of all the other stuff that we got going on. And then, uh, then, then comes the big day when they maybe venture out for that first employment interview. Wow. And we've got someone there that's going to be looking forward to hearing how it went when they come back. And these things build on and build on, and you can see in a good three, four, five month period of time a transformation take place. They have hope, which they might not have had when they walked through the door. Yeah. They have a sense of self that they might not have had when they first walked in. They might have gotten involved with our yoga program or meditation or a number of things that we offer. We have mm -hmm. over 250 meetings a month in our center of all sorts. and. Um, so you can see they're engaging with life again. That's what happens after a period of time. Yeah. It's a, quite a wonderful thing. Beautifully put. Hope, a sense of self, and engaging with life again. Mm. And people need a safe place if they, they haven't been doing that. Yes. If we didn't have that, none of this other stuff would take place. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Yeah. So, Kelly, I noticed when, when Gary was, uh, I think he called it uh, nudging. <laughs> nudging, nudging, nudging the flower, the, the flower. The I noticed that you, you had, you know, you, you, that resonated with you, that flower beginning to open up. What, what is it that you were feeling about that? That was my experience in the center. I, I have long-term recovery and I have a 12-step foundation, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time at the recovery center. And once um, I was nudged in, um, by my clinician uh, to try hanging out up there and seeing what was going on. She was hearing good things. I decided to go up and talk to Gary and 
and really found a great community there. I felt safe. I felt like I was around people who understood me without me needing to explain a thing. It gave me more confidence than I had found um, throughout all of the work that I had done in recovery. Um, Gary has really created a, a warm, welcoming, safe atmosphere of recovery up there at the center, and I just felt at home very quickly. That's beautiful. And I'm sorry, Gary. No, when she first volunteered there within a couple of weeks, we had her singing. <laughs> she was quite the singer, and we didn't know that when she first walked in the door. But her and our Michael, one of our uh, peer support people, really hit it off with music, and it was a lot of fun. That was a fun day. Yeah. <laughs> it's something that, that is beautiful to see, that, that, that person that's hidden. Absolutely. Behind the consequences Absolutely. of addiction. Yep. Behind there, that is that person that is sometimes so frightened to show themselves. Exactly. And I think, Kelly, uh, that well, one of the things that Gary mentioned was when there's that moment when people begin to give back. Is that what you experienced as a, a, a visitor, that eventually there was that moment where you began to give back? Well, just stepping in and, and wanting to volunteer was an opportunity to do that. Um, in early recovery, whatever program you choose to start living a sober life, they encourage some sort of service. And there's a reason for that. that that's a part of the engagement and being a part of the recovery community. And what you start to see happen is the more you engage and try to connect with other people in recovery, it's a win-win. You're, you're sharing your experiences. You're sharing what's worked with you, what hasn't. You're finding out that people actually like you for who you are. You know, you don't have to go in and act like something you're not. And your confidence in living a sober life starts starts building. And it was a beautiful way that, that mm. or metaphor that you have with the flower blooming, because that's really what happens the more you engage and give back and, and either do service or you know, start doing some peer-to-peer. -peer. Even if you're not volunteering to do that in the center, you start finding yourself doing that because you're connecting more with the people that you're seeing every day who are living healthier lifestyles. Very well put. And where, where do you think that first part comes from, that part where you characterized it as being understood without having had to explain yourself? Mm. What that, that, that sounds so fascinating mm. to me. <clears throat> but it, it, but it's also so simple. I mean, when when we're coming out of you know addiction and trying to be healthier, we often are trying to understand ourselves again. You know that brain disease that that you mentioned. You know we're we're not seeing things as clearly, but we're trying. Mm. And mm. for me, it, my experience was. I didn't understand how addiction had changed me. I, I was still me, but I had gone through such a, a traumatic experience just within my addiction because that was so different from who my core person is yes. to be able to be in a safe place where you know that you don't need to worry about um, triggers and things like that because Gary's created such a safe environment up there. I had the opportunity to build on who I was now. Nice. <clears throat> Beautiful. And that safe environment, Gary, I mean, I really think that's so pivotal to everything, that you have managed to place, like, the, the prime value on safety. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that somehow has become the norm, mm -hmm. the expectation. So any kind of behavior outside that is easily recognized. Right. Yeah. And then with that, though, because there are people that come in, especially like in wintertime, when they mm -hmm. want a warm place, cup of coffee. Mm -hmm but they're really not in recovery. Mm -hmm. So we just don't say, you know, you have to leave here. Mm -hmm. But what can we do to help you get to recovery? Do you mm -hmm. want to go to a treatment program? Mm -hmm. Do you want to mm -hmm. uh, go to uh, the detox center up mm -hmm. on Pearl Street? What If you want that kind of help, we're there to help you. Mm -hmm. If not, then we would ask them to leave because it does trigger the sure. rest of, of the... Course. Aus yeah. Of course. The other thing, though, going back, Ed, to your point about what... Kelly and not having to explain herself is that everyone in the center, whether they're volunteers, recovery coaches, staff, uh, peer support specialists, people who lead our yoga program, they're all people in recovery. Yeah, yeah. So they all know where, where, where yeah. people are starting yeah. at some level. We have people with yeah. years of recovery, with people with hours of recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to deal with. You just can be <laughs> yourself and know that there's an identification there and support. And then we go from there. Mm -hmm. um, leave the shame outside because there's no need for that here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just you are a human being, and 
with a lot of gifts and potential, and we want to know about those things. Such a wonderful and important message. You know, and Kelly, um, I wanted to, to give you some time because I know that you're the coordinator of the New Moms program yes. at the, the, the yep. Shittenden Turning Point. Speak about that mm. for a little bit. What is the New Moms program? Um, well, it's a grant that was uh, received last year uh, through the Department of Health, Maternal Child um, Health uh, Division, and ADAP is the second half of the grant. And um, they did a, um, a a survey of need in the in the community for recovery, and moms were identified as um, needing more more support. Uh, to try to achieve long-term recovery. So I myself in recovery um, was at the Lund Center and um, they did a really good job of helping me in the beginning of my recovery. And what was great was I could have my child with me. I have two children, but they, they're allowed to age five to be there with you while you're working in your recovery. And um, what's difficult about the Lund Center is a transition after. So uh, you graduate the the residential treatment and then you're out in the community and what do you do if you haven't had the opportunity to either build support within your community or whatever program you're working on outside and it's very limited the amount of time that you spend in the community to do this so um, what was identified was that transitional kind of support group for moms right. who are transitioning out of treatment with their children into the into the community so so that that transition then would be a heightened risk for the recurrence of substance use. Yeah. And we're seeing that more and more. We just had Andrew Gagnon, yeah. and it was that same transition. Mm -hmm. And there's a transition without support, then there's the chance of a recurrence of substance use. What a, what a beautiful place to create a program for moms and their, and their, and their children. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, yeah. Many, how many moms have you uh, had come to your program so far? Uh, well, since we began the support groups, we started with uh, two days a week and they're two hour walk in groups. It's not a start to finish. I present a subject of something that I've dealt with in my own experience mm. um, being out in the community and, you know, just speak to the women a little bit of, of my experience and then they, they start talking about their struggles and what's going on. And the beautiful thing is we've been able to pre create in our center a safe spot where the women can come with their children if need be. We have a little play area. We have a changing area for moms. We have an area that we can create a, a quiet space for them to nurse if they're still nursing their infants. And the numbers have been terrific. Yeah. I mean, a yeah. need was clearly met. The, yeah. <clears throat> there are so many women who are consistently participating and uh, we doubled our support group numbers for the New Moms program <coughs> in the first three months. Mm. And it, I was just completely overwhelmed by the response. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations to it's you both amazing. and to the other volunteers at the center. I mean, some would say that that particular population, the, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable mm -hmm. are the children <coughs> of, of people right. with this brain disease that we call addiction. Yeah. And other, others would say that in, in the support that you give moms, it's really a prevention program Absolutely. for yes, the children. Is. You want to, would you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. In my own experience, having two children and being a mom in recovery, I um, was fortunate enough to find the willingness to ask and use the support. I find a lot of women are very reluctant to use the supports that are out there because they're afraid. They've had DCF involvement. They're very paranoid that there's going to be consequences. And so I try to do the nudge <laughs> with, with the women to show them how it's helped me in my experience by using these supports. Um, I'm very passionate about the ACEs um, coming into Vermont. and, and Ad Adverse childhood experiences. Absolutely, mm -hmm. because I've seen what my addiction has done um, and, and caused trauma to my own children. And I can look back on that and I can point out the supports that were helpful and the, the things that we're still struggling with because this recovery is an everyday thing. And it is, you it add is the an everyday thing. Into it and and yep. you've Absolutely. got a, a full load of recovery all day long. And, and <laughs> along with the, the um, uh, resilience theory and adverse childhood experiences, you, we know now that one consistent, caring, committed adult in a child's life is enough to teach them resilience. And um, 
I'm sure that with your program, <clears throat> you're kind of multiplying that one times two times ten, and uh, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful thing That's great. to see how effort yeah. can really go so far. And um, you know, the more I have guests on the show, the more my uh, schedule for the year gets filled up <laughs> because I really, you know, I, I would like to have you come back on sure. the show again at some point in the future and really take a, a deeper look into both the, 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 the turning point of Chittenden County mm -hmm. and also the New Moms program and whatever other programs. Yeah, we have a wonderful new program of peer support specialists being in the emergency department at the hospital. Which there is, there uh, again is again, that transition. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Exactly. So you have a coach in the emergency room? Yep, yep. Beautiful. 24-7 coverage we'll have. So if someone is in there for something related to their addiction, some crisis, we'll have someone there that's had that experience and can be there to support them. All right, yeah. all right. Well, well, thank you. And thank to you, the viewing Ed. public, continue to uh, tune in for this uh, series. Uh, based on uh, the governor's uh, four pillars of, of uh, doing something about this opioid crisis that we face in Vermont. Treatment, uh, recovery, uh, uh, prevention, and law enforcement. Thank you, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.